بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so we are still on the uh, conquest of Mecca we're still talking about uh, the incidents that occurred in the conquest of Mecca and as is typical with all of the incidents of the Sira what we have is lots of narrations and we need to piece the puzzle together we need to figure out what exactly happened when so in our last class I went into a little bit of a tangent uh, regarding all of the various people that the Prophet ﷺ had not forgiven. Uh, and obviously each one of these stories took place over the course of the next two, three weeks. We just lumped them all together for logistics sake. But uh, even of those, we said they were either six or seven or eight or nine, even of those, the bulk of them eventually were forgiven and only a handful uh, were executed. Uh, and as we said, this is the general rule of Islam, that mercy and tolerance and compassion, but strictness must be shown as the exception to send some fear. There's got to be some sense of uh, uh, strictness in order that people do not cross the line. So we had mentioned all of these stories. Now let us return to the actual conquest of Mecca. We had mentioned the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave the khutbah straight from the doors of the Kaaba. And the symbolism is so obvious, it is so powerful that here he is standing in the Kaaba, quite literally, he's standing in the Kaaba. The doors are open behind him and the people of Mecca are gathered around him. And what a uh, beautiful, powerful scene. Quite metaphorically and symbolically, the doors of Allah are open up. And anybody is w who wants to embrace Islam can embrace Islam. And there is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the doors of the gate. I mean, the, 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 the symbolism here is simply too profound. It's too obvious that here the Prophet is standing at the doors of the Kaaba, the doors are open, and he is inviting them to accept Islam. And in front of him are all the people of Mecca, and he tells them, go forth, you are free today. And obviously he offers them to accept Islam, and at this point in time, he then uh, instructs Bilal the famous instruction and that is to climb up to the top of the Kaaba and to give the Adhan from the top of the Kaaba. This one incident of the Seerah is one of the most famous incidents that even somebody who doesn't know anything about the Seerah, the one or two things he will know is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored Bilal to be the first Mu'addin in Mecca, uh, the very first human being ever to give Adhan in the holiest of holies on top of the Kaaba was Bilal. And this is a lesson we have learned from our youth. And it is such a true lesson, even if we've heard it a million times, truly how amazing it is that the voice that used to call out in the valleys of Mecca, being persecuted by the Quraysh, the voice that used to testify to the unity of Allah in the valleys of Quraysh, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad, that same voice would be chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by His Messenger to now proclaim at a time of Izza. He who remain firm at a time of humiliation shall be honored at a time of Izza. He who remain firm and persevered during times of persecution, that will be the one who will come out on top during times of being honored. So, the one who kept his voice for the sake of Allah and refused to budge, that was the same person that was chosen to now announce and proclaim Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah on that, uh, on that beautiful day, on that auspicious occasion, on the top of the uh, Kaaba. And truly, it was... Uh, an honor that was unprecedented in the history of Arabia that an Abyssinian slave with no lineage and no background and no connections with any of the Quraysh should now be chosen to go literally and metaphorically on the highest of the high, literally above the Quraysh and metaphorically being chosen above them to proclaim on behalf of the Messenger of Allah, to proclaim the testimony of faith, the testimony of the Adhan. And of course, the Adhan summarizes the religion of Islam. It really summarizes the teachings of Islam. And we learn from this as well, the truth of that Islamic principle, and it is summarized in Arabic, and you should memorize this even if you don't speak Arabic, it is an Islamic principle. It is a Quranic and a Sunnah principle. al jazau min jins al-amal. al jazau min jins al-amal. This is an Islamic maxim, theological and fiqh. It is a rule that Allah and His Messenger uh, have shown to be true. And that is, you will be dealt with how you deserve to be dealt with. Good for good and bad for bad. Al-jaza'u, jaza' means your reward or your punishment. Min jins al-amal is going to be the same characteristic as the actions you did. 
So the one who, as we said, persevered and whose voice proclaimed the truth of Allah when being persecuted, that was the reward given to this voice, that now his voice will be chosen at times of izzah and honor to proclaim the truth of Allah and the oneness of Allah as well. And when Bilal's voice is now proclaiming the adhan, Abu Sufyan was standing there in the midst of some of the elite of the Quraysh. Of them is Al-Harith ibn Hisham and Itab ibn Asid. And, and these are all from the Banu Makhzum. And Al-Harith ibn Hisham, Al-Harith ibn Hisham, he is the, uh, you should write this down, it's a very important characteristic of Al-Harith, not an honorary one, but it's an important one. Al-Harith ibn Hisham is the full brother of Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl. This is his brother, Al-Harith ibn Hisham. And Al-Harith ibn Hisham, the full brother, both mother and father the same. Uh, and Al-Harith ibn Hisham was there with Abu Sufyan and Itab ibn Asid. And Itab says, uh, and they're all from the elite of the Banu Makhzum, uh, Al-Harith uh, and Itab. Itab says, Allah has honored my father Asid. Allah has honored my father for having him dead right now. It's a blessing he is dead right now. Allah has honored my father for having him dead right now. He doesn't have to see the humiliation upon us how this black man has been chosen above us. Subhanallah. This is, this is jahiliyyah, right? How this black man has been chosen above us to now stand on top of the uh, Kaaba. Thank God my father is dead not to see this. Look. This is now he's saying how much the hatred is that you're happy your father is dead rather than see Bilal on top of the Kaaba. So this is, Itab says this. And Al-Hadith, who's the full brother of Abu Jahl, Al-Hadith says that, Wallahi, if I thought this man was upon the truth, I would be following him. Meaning, he's not truthful. If I thought he was upon the truth, I would be following him. So he's saying, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, he's saying the Prophet is not truthful. And you understand. And he's mocking him. And Abu Sufyan, now Abu Sufyan, is he a Muslim right now or not? Yes, when did he accept Islam? A few hours ago. A few hours ago, correct? Because literally outside Mecca, the morning comes, he rushes back, right? So he's literally a brand new Muslim. What does Abu Sufyan say? Abu Sufyan said, as for me, my tongue is sealed. I'm too scared to say anything. Because if I were to say anything, even the rocks would inform the Prophet says somewhat of what I said. Now, this statement is very interesting. What does it show us? He's afraid, but he's still not. He's kind of in between, right? Like one side of him is still sympathetic to all that's been said right now. And another side is like, you know, I can't say anything right now. Sorry, guys. Meaning what? My heart is sympathetic to you. And what does this show? That for some people, Islam takes time. For some people, well, he's a politician as well, yes. That shows as well that no doubt, and politics ran in his blood, and we don't mean this in a negative way. We never say anything negative about the Sahaba. But no doubt, there was that sense of siyasa, of su'da, of being in charge. And Abu Sufyan, this statement is very interesting because it demonstrates Iman had not yet entered his heart, but still he's a Muslim. Like ironically, it's really bizarre. He believes that if I say something, the Prophet will find out. Which means what? He believes that the Prophet is a prophet, but still his soul is not submitting. And we see this over and over again, that Islam is of levels. And Allah mentions in the end of Surah Hujrat, what does Allah say? That, O oh Bedouins, you are not yet mu'mins, rather you are just Muslims. Don't say we are mu'mins, rather say we have accepted Islam. Iman has not yet fully entered your hearts. And we see this in the Sahaba and Wallahi, we see this in front of our lives as well when people convert to Islam. How many are the people who convert for whatever reason, whether it is marriage or whether, well in these days in America it's really only marriage. But in Islamic societies, people converted for fame, for, for getting rid of the taxes. Because if you converted, you'd have less taxes. The, the jizya and whatnot, right? People converted. Some of them remain so-so in their conversion. 
And we see this around us as well, that people convert, let's say, for marriage, and many of them, their Islam is mediocre, and we accept their Islam and leave their affair to Allah. And some amongst them, mashallah, tabarakallah, their Islam becomes stronger than the Islam of the born Muslim. We see this in our own lives. And we see this from the time of the Sahaba, that Abu Sufran right now is kind of battling it. I don't want to say anything. So, is that... A Oh, that's yours. Okay. I thought it was the masjid alarm. No problem. Okay. Personal doctor alarms are permissible. Doctors have darura. No problem. Uh, so uh, Abu Sufyan saying, I, I don't want to say anything or else uh, it must be exposed. So uh, later on when the, everything finishes, we'll come back to what the Prophet said. Later on, the Prophet is exiting the haram and he passes by the same group. He passes by Abu Sufyan al-Harith and Itab. And he says, I know exactly what the three of you said. <laughs> As for you, Ya Harith, you said such, such, such and such. As for you, Ya Itab, you said such and such. As for you, Ya Abu Safyan, you said such and such. He narrated for them, letter for letter and word for word, the whole conversation. Right then and there, Al Harith said, Wallahi, you must be a prophet. Because nobody was listening to our conversation and none of us want to inform you. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna kala Rasulullah. And Al Harith accepted on the spot, Itab eventually as well accepted, and of course Abu Sufyan has already been a Muslim, and Al-Harith ibn Hisham, uh, he later on his Islam became very strong, and he uh, narrated many hadith, well, there's a very famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari, that is a very beautiful hadith that after the conquest of Mecca, after the story, he asked the Prophet O oh, Messenger of Allah, tell me, how does the Wahi come to you? How does the wahi come to you? This is Al-Harith ibn Hisham. كيف يأتيك الوحي يا رسول الله? And Bukhari has this hadith and so many versions of this hadith. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, said to him, Sometimes the wahi comes to me like the ringing of a bell. And it's very difficult upon me. And sometimes Jibreel comes to me in the form of a man and I understand what he says and that's easier for me. Now it's interesting here that Al-Harith ibn Hisham had the audacity to ask a question that even Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali would never dare ask. And that is how does the wahi come to you? And sometimes a person who's not that close to you can ask you a very frank question and somebody who's much more closer to you will not ask you. The Sahaba were too shy to ask such probing questions. And that's why uh, Ibn Umar said that we would love it when an intelligent Bedouin would come to Medina. Intelligent and Bedouin. Two characteristics, right? That are rare, combined, but we would love it. Why? Because a Madani would never be so frank. And a Bedouin who's not intelligent wouldn't be of use to us. We would love it when an intelligent Bedouin would come to us, so he would ask questions and we would listen. Because the Sahaba had too much, in Arabic is called Hayba, and there is no simple term in English, but it's like reverence and respect to the level of, you cannot question these things. Can you imagine Abu Bakr saying, Ya Rasulullah, tell me about Jibreel and how he comes to you. No, the Sahaba are sitting with their heads down. The Sahaba, not one word comes from their mouths. Harith ibn Hisham is a brand new convert. He's like, tell me everything, I want to know. How does Jibreel come to you? And so the Prophet responds to him. And it is also narrated in another uh, incident later on that when the Prophet when his intent, was in his tent and Jibreel came down and the wahi began and the Sahaba recognized when the wahi began because he would close his eyes and he would lower his head and sweat would appear and he would be cut off from the world around him. So when that happened, Umar called Harith and said, now look, Wahi is coming. So when Harith came, he picked up the tent, the, 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 the flap of the tent, and he saw the state of the Prophet ﷺ when Wahi was coming down. And this is a privilege given to him because of who he was. Like he is one of the Sadat, one of the seniors of the Quraysh, and he converts. So, uh, so he, uh, he converted at this stage. He became a good Muslim. He died a Shaheed fighting against the Romans in the battles of, in the battle of Yarmouk. He died a Shaheed. And Al Harith ibn Hisham, by the way, uh, is involved in a story that all of you have heard here and there, and that is a famous story in the Battle of Yarmouk of three Sahaba dying one after the other when water is sent to them, and each one sees another Sahabi, and he says, go send it to that Sahabi, go send it to that Sahabi, and all three of them one by one until all three die, and the water still remains in the cup. You know the story. You've heard this. You've heard this so many times. We'll get to it. We'll get to it, okay? Uh, refresh the memory. So, 
uh, in the Battle of Yarmouk, which was one of the most important, decisive battles in the history of Islam. It was against the Romans and it paved the way to open up half of the you know, uh, kingdom of the Romans and uh, Syria and whatnot opened up after this. In the Battle of Yarmouk, uh, major losses on the side of both sides. It was a victory for the Muslims, but major losses in terms of lives killed. And one of the most interesting stories that takes place is that after the battle when the people are going to take care of the wounded, so uh, a boy comes and he sees a person who's almost dying. He gives him a glass of water. And uh, as he lifts the cup up, he sees somebody else in the distance who's also dying. He says, go send it to him. So the first person here is Al-Harith ibn Hisham. The second person, we already talked about him last week, Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl. Look now how their things are combined. So he says, go send it to Ikrima. And so they send it to Ikrima. And when Ikrima is about to take it, then he sees the third person, uh, Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'ah. So he says, send it to Ayyash. By the time he gets to Ayyash, Ayyash dies. He goes back to Harith, Harith is dead. He goes back to Ikrima, Ikrima is dead. So the glass remains with him and all three of them refused to take the glass because they saw somebody they thought was more in need. It's just interesting, subhanAllah, these now, the, the, the people that converted at the conquest, some of them their Islams were so-so and some of them their Islams went to the roof. Of those who proved themselves their strength of Islam were people like Al-Harith ibn Hisham and Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl. So the Prophet we said he gave the khutbah, he invited them to Islam, Bilal gives the adhan, he then made his way to Mount Safa. He made his way to Safa and he sat somewhere on Safa, perhaps in the middle, perhaps at the bottom. He sat somewhere on Safa and there he took the oath of allegiance for all of the people who were willing to embrace Islam. And uh, this is really the primary visualization of the statement of Allah This is this ayah coming into effect that hordes and hordes of people are just lining up thronging around him waiting to give the bay'ah the oath of allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how apt it is how perfect it is that where the da'wah began it shall end as well Where did the public da'wah begin? Mount Safa. This is where it began. And things are coming full to a circle. Everything is coming now to an end and a close. And our Prophet ﷺ sits down where he once stood up. There's also some symbolism here as well. That he now sits down to now pretty much finish off the task that began uh, tw 20 years ago. 19, 20 years ago, that began uh, tw two decades ago, and now people are coming to him embracing Islam, one after the other, and the bulk of the people of Mecca converted at this point in time. And uh, an interesting uh, anecdote here that a lot of fiqh is derived from, we're going to talk about the fiqh inshallah in the next lesson, uh, the benefits, the fiqhi benefits of the conquest of Mecca is next uh, lesson. One of the interesting tidbits here, one of the Sahaba comes with his brother, blood brother, the Sahabi is a previous convert and he says, Ya Rasulullah, this is my brother, my mushrik brother, this is my brother and I want you to give him the oath and the blessings of hijrah like you have given me. I eat the... Now, when anybody emigrated, the Prophet ﷺ gave him the good tidings that you have now done hijrah, you shall get jannah, this, that, all of the blessings. So, uh, this brother wanted his blood brother, sorry, this Muslim wanted his blood brother to get the same blessings he had. And this is Islam. You want for your brother what you want for yourself. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا هجرة بعد الفتح. This is one of the most famous hadith that ever was said in the conquest of Mecca. It's mutawatir, it's in Bukhari and Muslim. لا هجرة بعد الفتح. You want your brother to get the blessings of hijra? لا هجرة بعد الفتح. There is no hijra after the conquest of Mecca. All of the blessings of Hijrah were for those who got it. I can't give your brother those blessings anymore. He didn't, wasn't there, he didn't get it. لا هجرة بعد الفتح There is no Hijrah after the conquest of Mecca. This hadith is one of the most important fiqh benefits of the conquest of Mecca, which is not relevant to us, it was very relevant to them. And that was what? For seven or eight years, Hijra was fard ayn on every single Muslim alive. You had to make hijra, or else your Islam was deficient. You had to make hijra to Medina. When the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, that ruling was abrogated. And that's why most of you have never heard of it. Because it was applicable for eight years. 
That's it. When the Prophet conquered Mecca, he then abrogated the ruling. La hijrata ba'd al fatih There is no more hijrah after the conquest of Mecca. Now what does this mean? Nobody can make hijrah anywhere? No. That special hijrah, the one and only hijrah, the hijrah that when you say hijrah, you mean that hijrah. The one and only hijrah has been abrogated. You can have personal hijras. You can have hijras that will take place for various peoples, various tribes. A civil war takes place. A group of Muslims emigrates to another land for peace and protection. This is a personal hijra. It's not a general hijra for the ummah. The general hijra for the ummah is gone. لا هجرة بعد الفتح that is only after the conquest of Mecca, it has now become uh, the, the, the obligation of every single Muslim making hijrah is abrogated after the conquest of Mecca. Then the Prophet said, وَلَكِنْ جِهَادٌ وَنِيَّةٌ وَإِذَا اسْتَنْفَرْتُمْ فَانْفِرُوا The only thing that remains is jihad and good intention, meaning good deeds, whatever you have good deed for. And if your brother really wanted the hijrah and his niyyah was there, Allah will give him that. All that's only that remains. Walakin jihadun wa niyyah. If he wants to make the up what missed him, there's plenty of opportunity going to come now. There's going to be the Romans, the Persians, the jihad is going to start right now after the conquest of Mecca. The real conquest. This is now only Arabia. So the Prophet is predicting your brother wants to get to that level. There's two things he can do. Walakin jihadun wa niyyah. He can participate in, in the actual jihad against the Romans and the Persians and whatnot. Eventually he can get to that level. And niyyah. And niyyah of course means any good deed, including the niyyah for hijrah, including any ibadat. If he is genuinely good, perhaps he can also get to that level. And if you are called to fight by a legitimate khalifa, then obey the khawaida stanfarthum fanfiru. Means, and if you ever get the call to go out and fight on behalf of the ummah, then go and answer that uh, call. So. Uh, this beautiful, simple hadith, it demonstrates some of the fiqh, we'll get back to that next week. So he took the oath of allegiance from all of these uh, men. Then, after he had finished the oath of allegiance from the men, then the women were called. The women of the Quraysh were called. And all of them gathered in front of the Prophet uh, wasallam, and they all came, and uh, amongst them, wearing the full face veil, so unrecognized by anybody, was Hind binti Utbah, the wife of Abu Sufyan, the one who only a few hours ago was holding on to her husband's beard and mustache and saying, kill this cowardly da 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 da, the same one. This is now Hind over here in front of the Prophet wasallam, And of course, Hind has a history. You all know the history of Hind. You all know the history of Hind and the battle of Uhud and what she did. With Hamza. We, uh, this is something that she knew now. And she was scared of. And she is wearing a face veil. Now, uh, the issue of the face veil is a fiqh controversy. Not quite relevant to us. But the one thing that clearly reading the seerah shows us. Is that the face veil was known and practiced by the women in the time of the Prophet and Whether it's farther or not is a different story that's really besides the point. What I really want to emphasize is the claim that the face veil is an invention that was imported into medieval Islam. This claim is baseless. The face veil or the niqab has been a part of the Islamic tradition. Some scholars have said it's fard, some have said it is, it is not fard. That's a simple controversy of fiqh and that's besides the point here. What I want to just emphasize that many modernists or progressive, they claim that, oh, there is no place for the face veil in Islam. It never existed. No, this is not true. It clearly has existed. The tradition mentions this numerous times. And here we have another incident where some of the women, at least some, maybe it's not all, but at least some of them were wearing the face veil. Amongst them was Hind binti Utbah. And so they come all of them in front of the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ then begins that uh, you shall all give me the oath of allegiance. And he then quotes to them the verse that uh, uh, the, that is mentioned in the Quran. Uh, the, the, the verse is mentioned in the Quran. So he says that number one, that you shall not worship any besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Must abandon all of your false gods. At this Hind says, from the middle of the crowd. Hin says that she made an assumption which was incorrect. She said, you're asking of us something you didn't ask the men. Now this is wrong. She didn't, she wasn't there. She just assumed that this is a political conquest, not a religious conquest. Think about it. She assumed this is a political conquest. You are our ruler, but we can, you're not going to tell us to give up our gods. 
right? So then she got a little bit irritated and she said, you're demanding of us something you didn't demand from the men, but this is not true because the men were also told to give up, right? Uh, but then when she saw no support and whatnot, she said, very well, we shall give it to you. Okay, if you want this from us, then you're forced us. Khalas, we'll give it. Again, not too happy, but she doesn't have any choice here. So, and the Prophet has not recognized her. She's speaking from behind the niqab. But the very fact she's speaking, it shows her character, by the way. Think about it as well, right? And she's going to speak again and again. And it shows her character. She has that type of personality that she's not going to remain silent. And some people have that type of personality. Most people don't find it pleasant. Nonetheless, uh, so uh, she says that, uh, so the Prophet then says, Wala yasriqna. And you shall not steal. At this, she retorts back again. She says, I used to take from the money of Abu Sufyan bit by bit without his knowing. I don't know, was that allowed or not? This new thing you're putting upon me, I have to tell you, this is my characteristic, right? I take my husband's money. And he doesn't know this. And Abu Sufyan was there in the audience, so to try to resolve something, maybe something might happen, he said, all of that that has happened in the past, I have forgiven it. Meaning Abu Sufyan is probably more tense than she is. And Abu Sufyan wants to like diffuse the situation. Right now, this conversation gives away who the woman in niqab is. Right, so this conversation gives her away. So the Prophet says, "Are you Hind?" And now she's put on the spot. The slip of her tongue. She didn't want to give her identity away, but obviously she says, "I used to take from the money of Abu Sufyan." And so it gives away. And Abu Sufyan immediately. To calm the situation down, maybe she won't be forgiven, whatever. She says, I have forgiven anything of the past. Notice he said of the past, not the future. We'll deal with the future later on, wife, okay? Not the past, okay? So, uh, the Prophet said, are you Hind? And Hind immediately says that, yes, I am. And forgive the past, may Allah forgive you. Immediately. And forgive the past, may Allah forgive you. And the Prophet ﷺ did not respond to her and he simply moved on. And this really shows us as well, SubhanAllah, I mean, it's, it's uh, sometimes when a person who has not studied the seerah hears these types of stories, it's a little bit difficult, right? Because the perception they have is not the perception that is actually there. SubhanAllah, it's easier to forgive a crime against you than a crime against a loved one. It's easier to forgive a crime against you than to forgive a crime against a loved one, especially when that crime was done to the dead body. The I mean, astaghfirullah, and astaghfirullah, you know? And so the Prophet did not punish her, but nor did he say, you are forgiven. And wallahi, this is like perfect. He just moved on and ignored her. And this is absolutely perfect. Like, no doubt his heart, yani, what did he say to Wahshi? Just avoid my presence. He was forced to forgive. He did forgive. But he said, I don't want to see you. And that was such a punishment. As for Hind, Hind is not going to come to him. She's a woman. Hind is not going to be in his presence. So he just ignores her and lets it go. And this again shows us the uh, perfection of the Prophet wasallam. So he just ignores her and uh, moves on. And he goes to the next condition. Wala yaznina. And you shall not commit zina. Once again, Hind says, so every comment, she has to give a comment, right? Every single statement, she's got to give a comment. Wala yaznina, and you shall not commit zina. And Hind says, awataznil hurra? Do you expect a free lady to commit zina? Now, this is an interesting phrase here. It shows that Arabian society, no matter how much debauched and lewd it was, free ladies, what we would call decent ladies, Sharif ladies, right? They would never taint their family honor by this crime. It was people of lewd character. Unfortunately, in our society, this is gone. But for those of us who come from other lands, or for those who remember maybe in the 50s and 60s in this land, I don't know, you know, that type of notion was still there. Dignified families, decent families, this is unheard of. So when this condition was put, and Hind is a mushrika, I mean, you can say she's just accepted Islam one minute ago, but still, she is coming straight from paganism. 
she's difficultly, reluctantly giving up idolatry. Correct? Stealing, she's like, yeah, okay, if you really want us to. When it comes to zina, she gets irritated. You expect any of us to be committing zina? And it's really amazing because it shows us that the Quraysh and the Arabs, and wallahi, this isn't just, see, the, any, our scholars say that uh, crimes are really of, of two types. There are crimes that are lewd and uh, something that goes against dignity, even if you don't have iman and akhlaq. And then there are crimes that are not of that nature. And zina is a crime that really goes against modesty. It goes against haya. And therefore, and again, this country is the perfect example. You know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, fornication was really unheard of in the dignified society. You understand what I'm saying here, right? Only people of a lowly class, only the uh, women of immoral character that are known. You know, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, the women that are in that profession. But a dignified lady would never ever do this. So when the process and puts the condition immediately, she gets irritated. Like, what type of condition is this? Do you expect any of us to be committing zina? And this really shows us, as we said, that uh, the crime of zina is a, a different uh, category of, of crime. Then uh, the Prophet ﷺ, and again he's really ignoring her and it really shows us her character by the way and it shows us his character as well. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, وَلَا يَقْتُلْنَ أَوْلَادَكُنْ And don't kill your children. Here we see Hind's sharp tongue. She says, as for this one, then wallahi, we took care of them as babies and you killed them as adults at Badr. You're telling us not to kill our kids, right? As for, uh, as for this condition, we were the ones who took care of them when they were babies, and then you killed them as adults at the Battle of Badr. This was so unexpected, this barb, this, this sharp wit, that Umar ibn al-Khattab began laughing so much he fell onto his back. <laughs> this was such a novel response, right? That the way she understood this. That Umar ibn al-Khattab simply lost it there. He started laughing so hard he fell onto his back uh, laughing. And uh, he, so then these conditions were given. And then, the pro and then they all agreed to this. Hin's the only one with the tongue to respond back. And even then the Prophet and by and large ignores her. And then after this, uh, the Prophet tells to Umar that go take their oath of allegiance. And so Umar took the, took the oath of allegiance. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never ever touched the hand of a woman that was not related uh, to him. And this is narrated mutawatir by Aisha, by every single book of hadith, uh, that the Prophet did not himself take the oath of allegiance from the uh, women. And in fact, once when a woman, later on, not this incident, and in the next year, when a woman went to give, accept Islam, she put her hand out. And the Prophet said, I do not give the bay'ah uh, uh, with shaking your hand. My speech to the one of you is my bay'ah to all of you. Simply speaking to you is enough. I don't need to uh, uh, do this. And there is some controversy on, in the books of fiqh and in modern and the books of hadith and in modern fiqh scholars whether Umar ibn al-Khattab actually took the oath with his hand or not. There's some controversy. Uh, and there are some reports that indicate that Umar took the oath of allegiance from the woman physically. And there are some reports of this nature. And what it could also be said that this is what is understood in the authentic narration when the Prophet commands Umar, you take their oath and he doesn't do it. Because if it was only verbal, then he's done it. And if it's more than verbal, then Umar is doing something he didn't do. But uh, another group says that, well, the ahadith that mention Umar physically touched them are not to that level. They're, they're a little bit uh, shaky. And so from this, there's a controversy that has exist, existed from the beginning of the classical fiqh. And that is, is it allowed to uh, shake the non-mahram's hand? Uh, and the bulk of scholars historically have always said that it is not allowed. Some of the Shafi'i scholars and also some of the Hanbali scholars. So not all Shafi'i Hanbalis, but the Shafi'is are well known. A lot of Shafi'i scholars and 
and even some Hanbali scholars said, based on these narrations and others, that it is allowed with two conditions. Number one, that there is no fitna, there is no shahwa, there is no desire. And number two, there is a need to do so. And they point to this incident, for example, and they say, clearly there is a need, and Umar, it's not possible that Umar would have any, that's why Umar is chosen, the strictest out of all of them, that he is chosen. So, those scholars who say that it is allowed with these two conditions, they quote these types of narrations. Uh, and my opinion is that really it should be avoided and that it is uh, makru, uh, but I don't consider it to be haram if these two conditions are met, but I still say that that it should be uh, avoided and Allah Azza wa knows best and we have the example of the process and there's no denying the best example and that is as Aisha says Wallahi she swears by Allah the hand of the process that I've never touched the hand of any woman the hand of the process and never touch the hand of any woman except if it was one of his mahram so we have in the example of the process and the best example and if one of us uh, is not able to live up to that example then at least we should keep that example as the ideal and not change that around let's not justify some of us might not be able to do that let's not justify and say okay no the ideal is the ideal it is my opinion as i said that it is makru which means it should be avoided and it is not sinful nonetheless the ideal is the ideal any case getting back to the story so the process has now given the oath of allegiance to the Quraysh men and the women and the ansar uh, began to talk amongst themselves they feel a little bit neglected now right now for the process is now returned back home and they see all of his kith and kin, the relatives, the Quraysh, the cousins, they see everybody accepting Islam. And so the Ansar began to grumble and mumble. And one of them says, now that he has returned here, softness has overtaken him for his people. Meaning, khalas, he's forgotten about us. Right? They feel, now, subhanAllah, well, like, what, is, what is really the root of their pain? It's love. It's love. Right? They feel jealous that the Prophet now will forget about us. So, one of them remarks, the love of his relatives has overtaken him. And others seem to agree to this sentiment. And Jibreel came and told him, the Ansar are saying this. And so, when he finished with all of the bay'ah, he then called the Ansar. So we have the men, we have the women, now we have the Ansar. And he says, Ya ma'ashar al-ansar, O group of ansar, did you say that the love of my family has overtaken me, I've become soft? He quoted them exactly. And put on the spot, they confessed and they said, yes, this was said, O Messenger of Allah. We did say this. Now, it's amazing here. Allah tells him, Jibreel comes down and informs him. Yet he still asks them. Think about that. Why? Is he denying Jibreel? It's etiquette and courtesy. It is the manners. SubhanAllah, Allah is informing him. And he knows that Jibreel is not going to cut and paste and quote an evil picture. And the reason why Jibreel is telling him is to do what? Is to save a bigger fitna. You understand? Allah Azza wa Jalla is saving for a bigger fitna that make sure this doesn't go into a bigger fitna to quell down any problems. Yet still the first thing he does is he asks them, did you say this? Subhanallah, how beautiful of a message for us that when we hear a stranger or an acquaintance remark, oh, you know your friend said this about you. You know your cousin, your brother said this. Khalas instantaneously. Judge, jury, executioner, trial, khalas, that's it, end of story, done. You don't even want to give the benefit of doubt. Here we have Rasulullah being communicated by Allah through Jibreel. Any problem here, watertight. Yet still, what does he do? He says, did you say this? And there are ansar, of course they're going to not lie and cheat. They said, yes, we did, oh, yeah, we're guilty. Yes, we did say this. And so the Prophet said, who am I? Man ana, who am I? Ana Abdullahi wa Rasuluhu. I am Abdullah and Rasul. I have emigrated to you and with you and for you. Meaning I promised you, remember? I know that. Don't doubt my promise. I am Rasulullah. And I promised you something. And that promise will be maintained. And remember the promise. This is at the Aqaba. This is all the way at Aqaba. So many years ago. That 
the Prophet وسلم, the, the Sahaba, the Ansar, they, they said to him and they, they asked him point blank that will you ever leave us once the victory is yours? And he said no. Ad-damu damu, remember that. My blood is your blood. My life is your... He said that the, the famous phrase that really meant I am now a part of you and not a part of my people. I shall always now be a part of you. Now the Ansar are doubting. They're double guessing. So the Prophet ﷺ says to them, who do you think I am now that I'm going to break my promise? I am Abdullahi wa Rasuluhu. فَالْمَحْيَا مَحْيَاكُمْ وَالْمَمَاتُ مَمَاتُكُمْ And this cannot be translated into English. It basically means life is your life and death is your death. Meaning, my life is your life and my death is your death. Meaning, we are together in all of this. He gave a very powerful phrase. فَالْمَحْيَا مَحْيَاكُمْ وَالْمَمَاتُ مَمَاتُكُمْ Which basically means we are all together in this. And when he said this, the Ansar began to cry and they begged forgiveness and pleaded for uh, acceptance of, of you know, their excuse. And they said, we only said this based on what we thought and saw. We were wrong. In other words, they, they made an excuse for this. And the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ يُصَدِّقَانِكُمَا وَيَعْذِرَانِكُمَا That Allah and His Messenger believe you. you we know you're telling the truth and we have accepted your uh, excuse. And this is the primary uh, story narrative. After this, we have a number of incidents that we don't know exactly when it happened. Was it on this day or the next day? The process some stayed around two or three weeks in, Medi in Mecca. We'll talk about that next uh, Wednesday, inshallah. Uh, he stayed uh, almost three weeks. He stayed in Mecca. And in those uh, 19 days, many things happened. And so we have to just narrate bits and pieces. We don't know exactly when each of these things happened. And for the remainder of today, what I'm going to concentrate on is those people who did not accept Islam right now, but they accepted Islam in the next 19 days or a little bit after this, right? There are a number of significant people that did not give the bay'ah. The bulk of the people of Makkah gave bay'ah. Some very interesting characters kind of delayed. And of those people uh, uh, who delayed was one of the uh, Quraysh who we don't know much about him other than this story. I've tried to look him up and I could not find much information about him in the resources I, and the time that I have to do. And his name is Fudala ibn Umair. Uh, that uh, he seems to be a young man from the Quraysh. We don't know how much uh, how much was the distance between him and the Prophet ﷺ. But uh, Fudala ibn Umair, for whatever reason, he decided to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. He's so angry at the defeat. He's so angry at all that he has seen that he decides that khalas, I'm just going to assassinate. And this would be what we would call a suicide mission because there's no way he's coming out of this alive. There's no way he's going to be able to flee. So he hides the dagger, he hides the, 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 the thing and he says, I'll do it when the Prophet is doing tawaf. Because when he was doing tawaf, so everybody would give him space. Everybody would allow him to do tawaf and the Prophet did more tawaf than you can count. And from this we learn the sunnah that when you're in Mecca, you do a lot of tawafs. He only did one umrah, uh, not now, sorry, later on, but he did lots of tawafs. Throughout these 19 days, he did lots of, the umrah he did when he came back from Ji'irrana, when he came back from Hunayn. Now he didn't do an umrah, now this is the conquest. But in the conquest of Mecca, he did plenty of tawafs for those 19 days. And one of those tawafs, Fudala, comes up, the, the dagger is hidden, and uh, he sneaks up behind the Prophet Sallallahu and he thinks, khalas, I'll be able to finish the deed and then whatever happens, happens. This is an anger. This is a, he doesn't care about his own life now. So the Prophet as soon as he was about to pull out the dagger, he turns around. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu sees him and he says, is this Fudala? Are you Fudala? And so Fudala says, yes, it is me. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, what were you thinking about doing? So Fudala says, nothing. I wasn't thinking about anything. I was just doing dhikr of Allah and tawaf. I'm just here for the tawaf. And so the Prophet ﷺ laughed, probably because of the blatant lie, and he knows it's a lie. He laughed and he put his hand on the chest of Fudala. Put his hand on the chest of Fudala. And uh, he and he said, uh, uh, and before he did that, he said, Astaghfirullah. He said, Astaghfirullah. And he put his hand on the chest of Fudala. And Fudala says that, Wallahi, as soon as he placed his hand on my chest, no one was more beloved to me in the whole world than the Prophet wasallam. And Fudala then accepted Islam at that point in time. And the entire plot obviously is now into thin air, completely gone. Another uh, two very interesting converts are very high profile converts. Uh, 
Safwan ibn Umayyah is the first one. And uh, 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 and uh, Suhail ibn Amr is the second. Safwan ibn Umayyah and Suhail ibn Amr, they both converted in this uh, time frame. As for Safwan ibn uh, Umayyah, now who is Safwan ibn Umayyah? Who can remind me? The son of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And who's Umayyah ibn Khalaf? The owner of Bilal. This is Safwan ibn Umayyah. These are now of the leaders of the Quraysh. So Safwan ibn Umayyah, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, he was of those who tried to fight. When the fighting didn't work, alas, he fled. And he told his uh, family and whatnot, he said, I, I cannot live anymore, I'm just going to basically commit suicide. I'm going to go into the ocean and fling myself from the ocean. You guys take care of yourselves, basically. I, there's no way I'm going to live anymore. So, and I don't want to go anywhere else. So he basically told them, it's, it's now end of story for me. I'm just going to commit suicide. So he uh, fled from Mecca and he was going to make his way to Jeddah and from there take a ship. And then the thing was, that's what he said. He's going to basically drown himself. So that end of story, he doesn't have to worry about uh, living anymore. Now, his cousin and best friend, Umayr ibn Wahab. Now pause here. Who can remind me of the story of Safwan and Umayr? Who is there? Safwan and Umayr. Excellent. Yes, excellent. MashaAllah. One of our sisters remembers. Excellent. And our note keeper, as ever, is taking notes. <laughs> yeah. No, he was thinking. Oh, he was just about to say that. MashaAllah. Okay. Uh, and when did this take place, sister? Do you remember? Roughly after which battle? She is about to say it. <laughs> after Badr. After Badr, yes, you say it immediately after, yes. After Badr. After Badr, remember the story of Safwan and Umair, their cousins and their best friends. And Umair is saying, you know, I don't even mind. I'll go and attempt an assassination, but I have daughters and I have a debt or else I do it. And Safwan says, he's the rich guy. Safwan says, don't worry, I'll take care of your debts. And from now on, your daughters are my daughters. I'll treat them just like I would, the lavish everything is going to be their lifestyle now. Don't worry about it, you go and take care of it. And so, Safwan agrees to pay, Umair agrees to go. And so Umair takes the, 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 the dagger and the, um, the, 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 the poison and he hides it and he goes. And the point is, this is the negotiation for the prisoners of war, remember? So the access is given to the Prophet ﷺ. There will be right in front of the Prophet ﷺ. And he has his sword dangling in front of him and uh, the Prophet ﷺ even says to him, what do you have that sword around your neck for? And he says, oh this, oh, oh, you know, of what use was the swords in the battle of Badr anyway? It's just hanging there, right? Then the Prophet ﷺ said, you are lying. You and Safwan sitting in the shadow of the Kaaba, and you said this and he said this and he said this and you know, and he gave the whole, and he gave the whole narration. And so Umair immediately converted to Islam. He said, who told you this? And he said, Allah told me it. So immediately he converted to Islam. Safwan was bragging and boasting in the meantime, just wait, you guys are going to hear some good news, right? And Umair comes back and the good news turns out to be his Islam, right? That was the story of Safwan and Umair. So Umair had fled to, sorry, Umair had emigrated to Mecca, to Medina. So he is now a member of the Conquest. He's now coming to Fatih Mecca and he's hunting around. Where is my cousin? Where is my best friend Safwan? He finds out Safwan has fled and he's threatened to commit suicide. Whether he would have done it or not, Allah knows best, but that's what he said. I'm going to commit suicide. So Umair goes to the Prophet and begs him that, O Messenger of Allah, please give your protection to Safwan. Tell me that I can go and tell him he has protection. So the Prophet said, I have given him protection. Umair says, Give me something that I can show him that he will believe me. So the Prophet gave him the turban that he wore when he entered Mecca. The turban that he wore when he entered Mecca, he gave him the very turban. He said, go and show Safwan that he has the protection. So Umayr goes rushing to try to catch him and he barely catches him uh, in Jeddah before he's about to board the ship. Basically the ship would have been boarding the next day or something. And when Safwan sees him, Safwan becomes angry at him because Safwan says, so you traitor and liar, now you are coming to kill me. Meaning the only reason you could be here is to kill me. You're not even going to let me leave in peace. And Umayr says, no, I'm not here to kill you. I have come from the best human being and uh, I have come to get your protection. And initially he didn't believe anything. Initially he thinks, you're a liar and a traitor anyway. Now why would he say this? Because from his perspective, 
From his perspective, you came on a mission and now you have betrayed me. And I don't want anything to do with you. So clearly there is bitterness and animosity. Umair persisted. And Umair said, Ya Safwan, jiutuka min khayrin nas. I've come to you from the best of all human beings. He is your cousin. And he is uh, the most merciful and the most kind. His honor is your honor. And his sharaf is your sharaf. And his kingdom is your kingdom. And his izza is your izza. And here is his turban. He has sent it to you, promising if you come back, you will get protection. Now this shook him because here's the turban. This is the actual turban that he has seen and recognized the Prophet wore it when he entered Mecca. Now he is now in his hand and he's saying he's giving him protection. And so uh, Safwan was hesitant but he managed to be convinced to come back to Mecca. They returned back to the Kaaba and the Prophet was just finishing Salat al-Asr. Safwan turns to uh, Umair and says, how many times do you guys pray? He said, five times a day. Safwan said five times a day, which is what every new Muslim asks us as well. Five times a day. Yes, five times a day. And he leads you in salah five times a day. Yes, he leads us in salah five times a day. It's amazing for anybody who doesn't know our religion that you guys actually pray five times a day. Yes, we pray five times a day. Then when the Prophet finished Salat al-Asr, Safwan was still on his uh, horse, too scared to get down, wanting to flee if necessary. And he shouts out in front of the whole haram and he says, Ya Muhammad, Umair has come to me saying that you're promising a protection. Is this true? Meaning, I don't want to get off my horse until, until you confirm with me. And the Prophet ﷺ says, come and get off your horse. And, and, and he ends it, come down. And he says, no, until you promise me. Means he is very terrified. No, until you promise me. And you tell me that I have two months of protection. Nothing can harm me for nobody. None of you will harm me for two months. So the Prophet ﷺ said, we shall give you four months. Give you double that amount. And so when that was given, then Safwan came down from his horse and discussed with the Prophet ﷺ, but he did not accept Islam. He did not accept Islam right now. Notice as well, though I forgot to mention, that subhanAllah, when Umair is discussing with Safwan, notice the language of Umair. He is your cousin. His izza is your izza. His sharaf is your sharaf. His honor is your honor. This is jahili talk being done for the service of Islam. And it's because in the end of the day, lineage and blood doesn't matter in Islam. But for Safwan, it did. He's still viewing the world from that paradigm. And this shows us again that as long as what you say is true, yes, you can say it. His sharaf is your sharaf and his izzah is your izzah and he is your cousin, meaning cousin meaning kith and kin. He is your uh, Quraysh, uh, so you're so angry at somebody, the more he is honored, the more you will be honored, meaning from the Jahili stance, right? From the perspective of tribe and whatnot. And so notice here as well the techniques of da'wah. Notice here as well the techniques of da'wah. And we as well, we look at what this society, any society finds positive. If our religion finds it positive, we use it. Of course, if it doesn't, then we don't. But if anything is positive in any culture, and our religion as well finds it to be positive. So in our times, by the way, this is so, so many examples, but yani going green, for example, right? Or uh, humane treatment of animals. I've given a lecture here at MIC about uh, animal rights in Islam. You're not going to find classical scholars writing books about animal rights in Islam. But yes, our religion has animal rights. And it is a part of our duty to showcase what exactly our religion says, as long as we speak the truth. So here we have techniques of da'wah being emphasized. So uh, Safwan was given four months and eventually when the Prophet went to go fight in Hunayn and Ta'if, so he asked Safwan to lend him 100 coats of armor. Now Safwan is one of the richest people of Mecca. His father was Umayyah bin Khalaf. Safwan has inherited all of this. Umayyah died in Badr as you remember. And so he's inherited all of this fortune. So the Prophet says, give us some of your uh, weaponry. And Safwan says, are you forcing me to or are you asking me to? What is it? Is it something you are forcing that I have no choice or are you simply requesting and you, it's something that I have the choice to say? So the Prophet says, muadda. Rather this is a guaranteed loan. And this is from this so much fiqh is derived of them is that typically when you borrow something from somebody, you are responsible for what you have borrowed. If you borrow something from somebody and then you damage it, well then, Typically, you are responsible. So the Prophet said, it is a guaranteed loan. 
guaranteed lending. You know, not loan meaning a bank loan, but you know, it's uh, something I'm going to borrow from you and I guarantee it that it will come back to you or the equivalent will come back to you. If something happens, it's damaged, you'll get the money back basically. So Safwan gave him 100 um, coats of armor and he participated in Hunayn, but he didn't participate as a Muslim. He walked with the Muslims. Hunayn, of course, we'll talk about in two, three weeks, inshallah. Uh, he participated in Hunayn, but he wasn't actually uh, fighting so much. A group of non-Muslim Meccans physically went to Hunayn and they played a minor role. They didn't have any major role, they, and this is one of the non-Muslims. And Safwan was there, and after the Battle of Hunayn, when the Muslims and the Prophet were awarded the largest uh, ghanima in the history of Islam, took place ever, the largest ghanima ever. Even Khaybar pales in comparison to uh, Hunayn. Even Khaybar pales in comparison to Hunayn. So when they achieved what we would call tens of millions of dollars now in our turn, maybe even a hundred million, uh, and Safwan is simply flabbergasted, he's staggered at how much wealth. And he sees an entire valley of sheep and camels. And he's just looking and drooling at all of this wealth. And the Prophet says, أَتَعْجَبُ مِنْ هَذَا You are amazed at this? And he says, yes, of course, who wouldn't be? And so the Prophet said, all of this is yours, go take it. This is like a fortune, an entire valley of animals, camels and sheep and horses, an entire valley. It is all yours. And uh, Safwan, at that point in time, he says that such a gift can only come from the heart of a Nabi. This is a gift that is not human. No regular human can give it. Such a gift can only come from the heart of a Nabi. At that point in time, he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha wa ashhadu ka Rasulullah. Safwan needed to be bribed. And that bribe that was given was a bribe that no human could ever give. Because only a Rasul, only a Nabi, couldn't care less about money. Any one of us, we have that wealth, we'll keep a little bit, a big bit for ourselves, give a little bit to others. When all of this is at the disposal of the Prophet ﷺ, take it. One word, go take it. And Safwan is so shocked, he later narrates and is found in the books of Sirah al-Hadith. He said that, uh, that before the Prophet ﷺ gave me, he was the most despised person to me. But he gave and he continued to give until nobody was more beloved to me than him. People like Safwan who are wealthy, who are used to a certain love of this dunya, when they are shown really what love is more powerful than love of the dunya, that's love of the akhirah. When they are demonstrated to this, they see sincerity. And Safwan realized this is a sincere man. And again, brothers and sisters, like to me, what is the most amazing thing about all of these stories, and I've said this and again and again, but inshallah, and if perhaps to benefit, that these people are interacting with the best human being. And they've lived with him since before Islam and after Islam. And yet still they do not see that he is true. Can you imagine one of us stands to give da'wah and people don't convert and we think, oh, these people, their hearts are all sealed. Khalas, Allah's adab is upon them. Rasulullah amongst his own people and to the very end, what convinces Ikrimah he's about to drown? What convinces Safwan this major gift comes to him? What convinces other people? Other stories happen. Look at Abu Sufyan, still vacillating. This really shows us that Islam, to somebody who has not been born and raised into it, sometimes will be very difficult to accept. And we need to be on the more lax and generous and giving side. If Rasulullah could be refused and rejected so often by people that knew him, who do we think we are to stand five minutes in front of an audience and think everybody's going to convert as soon as my mouth opens up? This is arrogance and it is foolishness. And it doesn't work that way. So Safwan eventually, he converted to Islam. And he is an example of what is called Mu'allafati Khulubuhum, those whose hearts were basically, you know, captured by large amounts. And eventually Islam did enter his heart and uh, he died a shaheed and uh, he, he has a lot to, he, he, he became known as being a very uh, great worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, final incident we'll do um, for today inshallah that we'll resume again next uh, Wednesday. The final conversion story, again a very beautiful conversion story is 
another senior leader of the Quraysh who didn't convert immediately, and that is Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr. Who is Suhail ibn Amr? Everybody should know Suhail ibn Amr. That's very recent. Hudaybiyah. Hudaybiyah, the negotiator. Yes, he is the negotiator. The one whose son is Abu Jandal. His son is Abu Jandal. This is Suhail ibn Amr. So another senior leader. Now, Suhail ibn Amr, uh, now realize for us, all of these are just names. There's things we need to understand. Like, uh, Sufan ibn Umayyah, he's young. His father is the, the leader who died. Uh, as for Suhail, Suhail is to the age of Umayyah. Suhail is the elder guy. Suhail is like Abu Sufyan. As for Safwan, he's the young kid. He's like Ikrimah. That's a generation younger than the Prophet ﷺ. Let's not compare. The people that oppose the Prophet ﷺ, the Abu Jahls and the Umayyads, and the Umayyads, excuse me, right? The, the people who opposed him, they're like Abu Sufyan and Suhail ibn Amr. These are the people that are still alive right now. So, Suhail is one of those that is still alive. Of the senior the, the people who actually did what they did. So when the, 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 the Sahaba conquer Mecca, Suhail becomes terrified. He locks himself in his house. He's terrified. He doesn't flee. He locks himself in his house. I'm worried now what's going to happen. And most of his sons had converted. A number of them were in the army of the conquest. right? Most of his sons have converted. And a, number, a number of them were in the army that are coming in. And he tells his eldest son, Abdullah, uh, to go and beg for forgiveness for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even though Suhail's name was not on the list of those who are not forgiven. So technically he is under the general forgiveness but Suhail is terrified. And Suhail tells his son Abdullah, he says to his son, I don't know anybody who is still alive who has done more wrong to this man than me. Now that might be a bit of an exaggeration but just a bit. Because of the senior leaders He's one of the few that's still alive. There are others who have done more, but of the senior leaders, he's one of the few that's still alive. And then he begins listening to his son. I participated at Badr, and I was there at Uhud, and I was at Khandaq, and I showed him that harshness at Hudaybiyah. He knows this and he says it. I was the one who refused to budge at Hudaybiyah. And now, I don't know what he will do to me, so go and beg for uh, forgiveness. And you see that he feels now guilty and remorseful and inshallah yani you can sense that now iman is coming into his heart so abdullah goes to the prophet ﷺ and he says ya rasulullah my father is asking for protection even though as we said his name was not on the list but he wants special protection so the prophet ﷺ said yes he is protected by the protection of allah his son rejoiced and raced back to bring uh, his father and he told his father uh, suhail ibn amr that rasulullah has given you protection to which suhail said truly this man has been righteous as a young boy and as an adult and wallahi subhanallah what a beautiful phrase truly this man has been righteous as a young man before Islam, he was always known. And even as now an adult, he is shown his righteousness. And SubhanAllah, Suhail is probably now in his late 60s now. You know, because he's known the Prophet as a young boy. And so he's saying, this is a person, we know him, his manner and characteristic from the very beginning. And the Prophet told the Sahaba that when Suhail comes, give him respect and do not stare at him, meaning in a mean way. Because they're all going to be angry. Right? So don't stare at him, for he is a man of intelligence and honor. Dhu sharaf wa aqal. He is a man of intelligence and honor, and he is too intelligent to be ignorant and jahil of Islam, and if he sees benefit, then he shall accept Islam. Now subhanAllah, look, the Prophet is even telling the Sahaba, don't show your anger, just in your facial expressions, don't show it. He's setting the stage for the man of honor to come and be received. And wallahi, nobody asked for forgiveness from the Prophet ﷺ except that he was forgiven in the conquest of Mecca. Nobody, including Abdullah ibn, ibn Abi Sarha, the one that became Murtad, and the Prophet ﷺ himself wanted to execute, but Allah had willed otherwise. You know the story from last Wednesday. Nobody asked for forgiveness except that he was uh, forgiven. So Suhail came to the Prophet ﷺ, and after a conversation, he did not accept Islam immediately, but once again he was given some time and eventually he converted to Islam after the conquest of Mecca, uh, sorry, after the conquest of Hunayn, 
and Ta'if, uh, uh, the battle of Ta'if and, and the conquest of Hunayn, he converted to Islam in the next month, and he also uh, lived uh, a life of uh, charity and sadaqa and uh, zakah. Uh, one more story, inshallah, because again, I don't want to, um, subhanAllah, I didn't realize the conquest of Makkah would take us, what is this, the fifth week now? Um, but mashallah, alhamdulillah, there's so many beautiful stories. One more, inshallah, so that we can uh, minimize next week. A uh, very simple and very beautiful story. And that is the conversion of perhaps the oldest man in Mecca alive at this time, Ibn Abi Qahafa. Ibn Abi Qahafa, the father of Abu Bakr. Abu Qahafa, sorry. The father of Abu Bakr, not Ibn. Ibn Abi Qahafa is Abu Bakr. Abu Qahafa is uh, Abu Bakr's father. The conversion of Abu Qahafa. Uh, Abu Qahafa, uh, at this point in time, is completely blind and he cannot walk except with difficulty and he needs a guide. And uh, Abu Qahafa uh, refused to convert to Islam for, uh, throughout the entire prophetic message. You know what he did during the Hijrah. Uh, you know that he expressed his anger and animosity to Abu Bakr himself uh, and the family of Abu Bakr. Uh, and he was of those who verbally was opposed to the message and teachings of Islam. And he was not able to physically come to the gathering uh, of the Haram and the Khutbah because he's too old. But when the Prophet ﷺ was sitting and accepting the oath of allegiance, so Asma binti Abi Bakr, uh, the granddaughter of Abu Qahafa, brought her grandfather by the hand and was leading him to the Prophet ﷺ to get the oath of allegiance. And Abu Bakr was sitting uh, with the Prophet ﷺ as well. And when Abu Qahafa came, the Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Bakr, why didn't you leave the Shaykh, the old man? We would have come to him in his house. Subhanallah. This is an amazing phrase here. Why didn't you leave the old man? And he called him the Shaykh, and the Shaykh meant the old man. Why didn't you leave the Shaykh? We would have come to him. And Abu Bakr said, No, Wallahi Ya Rasulullah, it is more befitting, he comes to you. And such humility, did, did not our Prophet wasallam say, He is not of us who doesn't show respect to our elders and mercy to our youngers. This is it here. He is not of us who does not show respect to our elders. So the Prophet is showing respect to uh, the elder, the elder, oldest person in Mecca. And also we clearly notice here a very simple point and that is, why is Abu Qahafa being shown such respect? Because of Abu Bakr. Because of Abu Bakr. None of the other elders got shown this respect. And this shows us you treat people based on their rank and their lineage and with, on what they have done and what their even families have done. There's nothing un-Islamic about this. This is not just common sense, it is Islamic. When there's a noble family, when there's a person that's done something, that person's brother, that person's relative, automatically you will treat that person in a way that is different. And there's nothing un-Islamic about this. The reason why Abu Qahafa is being given this first class upgrade, that the Prophet is saying, you should have left him, we would have come to him. It's not because of Abu Qahafa, it's because of the son of Abu Qahafa. It's because of who Abu Bakr is. And the Prophet is showing Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr status, not Abu Qahafa status. You should have left him at home, I would have come to him. And Abu Bakr knows who the Prophet is and he says, no, he should have come to you. And they spoke for a while and eventually Abu Qahafa agrees to accept Islam. And uh, the famous hadith, which is lots of fiqh to be derived from it, but not quite about the conquest of Mecca, but Abu Qahafa's beard and hair was completely white, pigeon white, nothing but white. He's probably at this stage uh, 80 years old, completely white. And the Prophet tells the women and the family around Abu Qahafa that when you go home, then change this whiteness, but avoid black. And from this, the fiqh is derived that those who have completely white hair and beards uh, and, and hair, they should change it to another color, uh, not white and not black. Or by black, we should say the color that is naturally there. So a red-haired person should not dye it red. 
But whatever is your natural hair color, you dye something else to show that it's a, a, a dyed thing. And this is the primary hadith that is used to show that dyeing the hair that is pure white is sunnah, but you should avoid uh, black. Now, there's a, a, a narration here mentioned by uh, the famous hadith scholar of our times, Abu Ishaq al Huwaini. He mentions a narration. Uh, I couldn't find it in, in my sources, but I trust uh, Sheikh Abu Ishaq in this regard. Uh, that uh, when the uh, uh, when Abu Qahafa put his hand in the hand of the Prophet وسلم, to take the oath of allegiance, Abu Bakr began to cry and sob. And so the Prophet وسلم, said that, Ya Abu Bakr, why are you crying? This is such a happy day that your father has accepted Islam. And uh, Abu Bakr says, Ya Rasulullah, how I wish that the hand that I'm seeing now is the hand of your uncle Abu Talib rather than the hand of my own father. How I wish that the hand I'm seeing now is the hand of Abu Talib. Meaning everybody's accepting Islam now. Everybody. And even my father whom I never ever imagined to accept Islam. And his father is of the age of Abu Talib. His father is not even the generation of Abu Sufyan. This is the generation before. Right? And the only person that we know of that's still alive of that generation is the father of Abu Bakr. Everybody else of that generation, we don't know of them in, in the seerah uh, at this time. So memories are coming back that are associated with that generation. And when Abu Qahaf is accepting Islam, all Abu Bakr can think of, Ya Rasulullah, I would give up anything. I would give up my own father's Islam to see the Islam of someone who was your father figure, your full uncle, and that is Abu Talib. And wallahi, this type of love, it is beyond words. Wallahi, there's nothing I can say here. I cannot, is, I can't do justice. What type of human is there? Wallahi, what type of love is there? That Abu Bakr is crying because he wants a pleasure to the Prophet that is more pleasurable to him than the Islam of his own father. And that is the Islam of Abu Talib. He's crying because it's saying, I would have given this up because I know how happy you would have been. And he feels, yani it's a type, how, how to phrase this, like he feels a little bit selfish that I am taking honor and glory on this day, Ya Rasulullah, when it should be your relative. That's how the love that he has, he feels, I'm taking it away from you, Ya Rasulullah. I shouldn't be this happy. It should be your happiness. And I will gladly have handed it over to you if that opportunity were there. What type of love is this, Wallahi, that Abu Bakr has for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? It is something really and truly beyond any words that we can say. Uh, inshallah, our time is up for today. We still have some final conversion stories left. And then, inshallah, Inshallah, next week we will wrap up the conquest of Mecca. Uh, wallahi, it took much longer than I thought, but Inshallah, there's benefit in, in this. And uh, the goal really is to be detailed. I don't want to uh, skip over anything. The goal is to go into every single benefit and detail that is beneficial to us, Inshallah. Uh, and we have a few minutes for questions today. Usually we don't have time for questions. We have a few minutes before Salat al Isha for questions. Yes. From what we know, so Safwan ibn Umayyah received a portion of the spoils of war. Not all of them. It was much more than that even. That's the point. The spoils of war wasn't just one valley. But Safwan was of those who received one of the largest portions and shares. Okay. Other questions? Yes. I'm pretty sure Dr. Bashar is sitting here. If you give us fifty thousand dollars, we'll give you your parking lot right in front of the front of the masjid. No problem, Yaqi. Not a problem at all. Okay. Yes, you can. Wallahi, what's the problem in that? Why why is that a problem? You we show we show honor to people in this world who deserve honor and we leave Allah's blessings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this world, somebody who has done service for Islam, we show him an honor and that honor should be proportional and relative. Did not our Prophet ﷺ say that inna min ijlalillahi ta'ala, a part of showing glory to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to show glory to 
an elderly Muslim who's grown up in Islam, yani a shab, a shayba, the one that has white hair, and to a ruler that is ruling justly, and to a hamil al-Qur'an, the one who has memorized the Qur'an, who acts upon it. Inna min ijlalillahi ta'ala. So we're showing honor to Allah by showing honor to three categories who have done things for Islam. The one of them, he's lived his whole life righteously and now he's reached an elderly age. It's part of showing glory to Allah to show him glory. Another is the just Muslim ruler, which is rarely cited these days, endangered species. I don't think we have seen one for millennia, but theoretically they exist somewhere but not in the world we live in apparently right now, especially in light of latest tragedies in Egypt or not. But in any case, let me not start on that one. But the just Muslim ruler, and the third one is the Hamil al-Quran, غير الغالفي والجافي ولا الجافي عن, the one who is memorized the Quran. What does this show us, ya akhi? What does this show us? The one who has done good for Islam, we show him honor in this world. So the one who has built a masjid, there's nothing wrong if you... Yani, give him a little bit stronger handshake, smile a little bit more in his presence than you would, right? And just show him a little bit more respect. Realizing that you don't want to cause him a fitna either. Realizing that you don't want to ruin his intention. But yes, for you and us, when we find somebody like this, it is a part of our religion to show this person a little bit more respect and honor for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? You had the hand raised. Good, yeah. No, I think that was my slip of the tongue. Yeah, uh, I think that's my slip of the tongue. Uh, uh, let me check back, but as far as I remember, Hind did not say, at least in Ibn Ishaq, I'll check back tonight, but I don't think Rasulullah has mentioned. That's my slip of the tongue. Uh, good point. So the Sahaba are lined up behind the Prophet. So some of the women are in front, right? So Abu Sufyan was there, Umar was there. So when she says this, Umar just, it's such an unexpected answer. Wallahi, it is, you know? Yani, it's completely out of the blue that Umar just started laughing and fell back onto a rock that was behind him. Uh, it, it shows us, yani, it shows us the humanity of Umar. And they can even take a joke. Yes, final question. Go ahead, yes. So there's an ikhtilaf about women uh, dying the same color or not. Uh, but inshallah, the strongest position is that this prohibition does not apply to women. That women can dye their hair black and that it is applicable to men only. And Allah knows best.